I'm Dr. Anil Gode. I'm a consultant in reproductive medicine, surgery and assisted conception at Fertility Plus and at the Homeworth and Fertility Center. So today we're trying to talk on ovulation induction and trying to see whether we can lower the cost of continued ovulation induction or do we need to move to gonadotropins? Now that's a question which is often asked on and on. Uh, when should we start gonadotropins? Or rather I'll say, how long can we continue oral agents? And the reason why that is important is there's a cost of gonadotropins that is there. And also you have to base it on what are chances of pregnancy. So let's look at this paper, which shared, said, should we continue clomiphene or switch to gonadotropins? And the question here asked is, does the endometrium play an important role in deciding which drug we should change over to? Now, what we do know is that anovulatory, and that is basically PCOS, there's anovulation between eight and 13%, and clomiphene restores ovulation in almost 75% of cases. And around six cycles of treatment, the success rate of around 50% can be achieved. And usually, if a pregnancy does not occur, then you switch to gonadotropins as a next treatment. In a recent trial which was done of 666 women, gonadotropins or clomiphene continued for another six cycles and alive birth rates were higher for gonadotropins and slightly lower for clomiphene. So the question here asked is, does, by looking at the endometrium, can it be used to decide on which patients should continue on clomiphene or rather let's replace it and say, oral agents, or should they move to gonadotropins? So if you look at the materials and methods, PCOS women, WHO2 classification of anovulation, that ovulated for six cycles of clomiphene and had not conceived, and women were then randomly allocated of gonadotropin six cycles plus intrauterine insemination, gonadotropins, six cycles plus sexual intercourse, six cycles of gonadotropins plus IUI, and six cycles of clomiphene plus intercourse. And this was on a one by one basis. Gonadotropins used were between 50 and 75, and triggering was done by 5000 HCG. Clomid was between 50 and 150, and again, triggering was done with HCG. Those who were trying sexual intercourse, they had a basal body temperature and urine LH levels. And a mid-cycle endometrial thickness was taken. So if you ha have a look at the red line and the blue line, and that's they represent gonadotrophins and clomiphene, the endometrial thickness cutoff was put at seven millimeter. And if the endometrial thickness was less than or equal to seven millimeter, gonadotropins had a better chance of pregnancy for live birth rate of around 56%, while clomiphene dropped to 34%. And if the endometrial thickness was greater than seven millimeter, and then gonadotropins and clomiphene gave a very similar live birth rate. If you again look at the endometrial thickness and a mean time to pregnancy, if the endometrium was less than or equal to seven millimeter, gonadotropins achieved a pregnancy sooner. And if the endometrium was more than seven millimeter, the time to conception seemed to be very much similar. And again, regarding the dose of clomiphene, there was no difference in live birth rates with 100 or more than 100. And there was no association of the dose of clomiphene with endometrial thickness. And as I said always in my earlier talks that uh, I think if you get a thin endometrium with clomiphene, changing the dose or adding estrogen does not largely benefit. So don't try and do that because that, that seems to lower the chance of, of pregnancy. 
But also it is noticed that endometrium on, on gonadotrophins will always be slightly thicker and probably that aids the pregnancy rates. So again, what is the summary from this in any paper for, from a clinician's point of view? And what do you want to know? You want to say, you know, I, you've got a patient sitting in front of you and the patient says, I, I, I want to be helped, but I don't have adequate amount of money. I, I, I can't afford such high you know, course of gonadotrophins. And what this paper may be giving us an idea is that if there is ovulatory and if the endometrium is less than or equal to seven millimeter, I think we should be able to tell the patient that I think moving to gonadotrophins is certainly better. In women with greater than seven millimeter in the sixth cycle, continuing clomiphene may give you the same live birth rates. Again, if the endometrium is less than seven millimeters, it's probably the negative effect of, on the endometrium is a possibility. And as soon as the endometrium starts crossing seven millimeter, the negative impact of clomiphene on the endometrium does not remain. So in conclusion, I would say, but this again in very simple terms is, if you do not see a pregnancy, many of us would move on now let's say I, I tend to use letrozole more than clomiphene, and and many of us would end up moving on to gonadotrophins after three or four cycles. Now, if in six cycles you don't see a pregnancy, then continuing clomiphene is a possibility provided the endometrium is good, that is more than seven millimeter. Now, if the endometrium is thin, is less than seven millimeter, then it is much better to move to gonadotrophins because that will give you a much better chance of success. Thank you very much. So this was a short presentation. The take home message basically is relying on the endometrium to make the decision of whether to proceed with continuing the oral agents or trying to move forward. A simple short paper. Thank you very much for listening.